talk about the human cognitive architecture from the evolutionary education psychology perspective, uh, like biological primary knowledge and bi biological secondary knowledge, uh, and also its consequences about instruction. Uh, instruction. So this week, Slava is going to uh, talk about types of cognitive load and also how we are going to design instructions from uh, by considering different types of cognitive load. Okay, Slava. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming here. There's no microphone today, so I have to speak for the while, right? Okay. Okay, um, right, so today is the second lecture. We're going to talk about working memory and cognitive load. So just to refresh and put it in some perspective. So last, last week, we talked about human cognitive architecture from two points of view or two perspectives on it. The first one was uh, experimental psychology, so the empirical perspective, which is, was around this diagram showing the major component of, of this human cognitive architecture. And today we are interested in that one, which is a walking memory. Last week we talked briefly about characteristic the walking memory is uh, some component where we consciously process information. We're trying to make sense of information, especially new information that coming from outside um, uh, from sensory memory, or sometimes it coming maybe from long-term memory, but long-term memory that's something we already knew. So we don't need to make much sense. It's already it's already there. So specifically, I I provided like an example. This case when some new information coming from outside world through sensory memory, something new that we're trying to make sense like i use this example of that some chinese character <clears throat> that we will if we don't know what it's if we know directly what it means we don't need any working memory it would be perceived directly through long-term memory because it's already there this, this part in the store there and we will make sense of that if we don't know we will try to make some some kind of uh, reasoning here what that character might mean so some something that resemble human uh, um, uh, with uh, hands and legs and so on so it's to my understanding that means in, in the character means head so but anyway we, we we can we can think about it and we're going to do it in, in working memory uh, on on other side we we'll look last last week of this evolutionary so-called evolutionary perspective uh, from five principles of natural information processing system with human cognitive system is an example of that natural information processing system. So we outlined five principles and one of those principles was the so-called narrow limits of change principle. I'm not going to review all the five of them, but this one, because this one directly related to working memory, because oh, well, uh, it's the link. Yeah, I think I might hope. Uh, I believe that every um, every natural information processing system, according to this approach, uh, has this characteristic, has some mechanism that limits the uh, scope of changes, immediate changes to the knowledge base. And for example, in case of of, of bio biological uh, system, biological evolution, we know that random mutations are very limited. If they're not limited, we have the cancer. As they normally, they're very limited, small change over the long period of time. By analogy, in human working memory, this role, actually, this mechanism is, is, is played by working memory. The change to knowledge base in long term memory would be limited and limited by working memory because working memory is limited. So essentially, working memory represents this specific mechanism in human cognition that implements this uh, general principle of natural information processing system. So we look from those perspective and today therefore we look in more details about this working memory. We look at some uh, uh, main, main characteristic of working memory. Uh, then we go to kind of applied side of this. The working memory 
uh, as a as a in, in cognitive load theory because limitations of working memory that's a major factor that actually considered it in cognitive load theory we will see what what the cognitive load is and, and so on so the second most longest part of this presentation would be about some introduction to cognitive load theory uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using mostly material that uh, I, I use to present some introduction to working memory, to cognitive load theory, to, to for example, to students in USW when I was uh, teaching. So, um, uh, pretty much a general introduction, basic introduction with some uh, some examples. And then we finish with with kind of addressing that other perspective a little bit, that evolutionary perspective what, what the evolutionary advantages of of information processing through limited working memory is there any advantages of this limited working memory there should be some if we evolve with this limited working memory there is some consideration what those advantages could be and 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 how we can uh, theorize about that why why we have this limited working memory all right so uh, speaking about working memory generally as an introduction there are probably most of you uh, familiar with this concept, especially considering that it originated actually in the United Kingdom uh, by Alan Baddeley, its most famous researcher in, in, in the described all the working memory for the you know, and so on. So it's generally speaking, it, it's easily to, to talk about working memory as a place of consciousness or awareness or anything that we are conscious about currently at this moment is believed to be in working memory. Uh, or on the other side, we say that also related to focus of attention. We, we will focus attention at this specific moment. We think about it. We process this specific information. In a few moments, we switch focus of attention to other things, and we're going to think about consciously about other things, and that would be counted the working memory at that time. So it's 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 continuously essentially changing, uh, depending on our focus of attention. So what is we consciously thinking about at the current moment, that what in working memory. And the time scale here essentially a matter of seconds. So um, uh, if we rehearse something intentionally, we can keep that information for longer. But if we don't intentionally sort of rehearse it, we, we essentially uh, talking about a few seconds as a as, uh, time. Uh, scale of working memory operation. So, for example, if, if uh, you ask to repeat some unfamiliar new telephone number, like mobile number, something that probably would be 10, 12, with some digits depending on the country and so on, that, that you, 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 you would be possibly able to, to, to keep it in your working memory for some time, or at least most of those, those, most of those numbers. But uh, 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 after a few seconds, that will disappear. But you can at least keep that telephone number between the time you saw it on a paper or someone told you and, and before you dial something. Uh, if it's too long, you, you probably lose some of that. Uh, or if you put it on, on the paper, uh, that would be kind of extension of working memory. So if I ask you, what, what can, can you remember what, you just, what, what you've been just doing just before this moment? Some of you were maybe writing something, some looking at the screen and reading uh, just a few moments ago. That still would be in your working memory. You would be able to record that. In, 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 in a more in the 10 in 20 in seconds or, or half a minute, probably you will be, the, that information will be discarded. That will go uh, until you consciously uh, thinking about it, continue to thinking about it. So that again, something in, <clears throat> in working memory. If I ask you to, to do this, this operation again, you involve your working memory, you, doing, uh, uh, you do this addition, uh, storing some intermediate products uh, and, and adding them again. That would be <clears throat> something that you will be doing in your working memory. That's kind of conscious processing, manipulation of information uh, is also uh, part of working memory uh, operation, right? But if, if I ask you to do something like this, this addition, uh, that probably would be too, too difficult uh, because your working memory will be clearly overloaded here. So you might do some initial, some storage, but that probably will be lost and, and you wouldn't be able to complete this <clears throat> in your working memory only. You might need to take some paper, make some notes, 
but that essentially could be considered as your extension of your working memory because it's limited but if you put it on paper you make something permanent in this case so you you get around those limitations of working memory in this in this way um other questions that we need also address uh, what the difference between short-term memory and working memory because initially in, in experimental psychology that short-term memory was uh, was was what considered it was was famous and, and we're going to talk about it short it's short-term memory span by george miller seven plus minus two people talk about short-term memory and then from mid 70s the alan badley started talking mostly about this working memory because that was believed to be more more comprehensive concept that include not only storage temporary storage for short term uh, for, for, uh, for 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 short term but more, but also some manipulation information and that actually happened to be the most important function of working memory not just storage but actually the whole processing all manipulation information so it's much more comprehensive uh, concept that actually subsumes its short-term memory. So short-term memory is essentially that we can say that part of function of working memory that actually responsible for temporary storage. So when we're talking about some task like serial recall of, of, of numbers, uh, some so-called digit spans, when we have to recall previously presented some chain of digits or, or letters or any other symbols in so kind of in many experimental psychology uh, studies they do this type of uh, uh, use this type of material uh, simple the only storage mostly involved only not almost also not always because sometimes we do already some processing of that we try to see some familiar patterns in those presumably random chains of digits. I mean, in this case, we already do some processing as well. So it's, it's not that even easy to, 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 to come up with this purely storage type of task. Some completely random, probably, uh, uh, numbers, uh, recall of those chains of completely random numbers or symbols would be uh, represents a, a task for when only short-term storage, uh, short-term memory is involved. But but usually we're talking about more working memory, which is involved not only storage, but some meaningful processing of, of information. It's more complex cognitive task. And essentially, when we're talking about learning, we're talking about complex cognitive tasks. We don't talking about learning some random uh, chain of, of, of symbols or anything. We, we're talking about some learning meaningful information that always needs some manipulation processing. In learning so therefore uh, we need to talk in this case about working memory not just short-term memory so um, <clears throat> capacity of working memory so how much information we can process at the same time so firstly in 56 on uh, just at the beginning of, of that of cognitive science uh, 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 Aaron was a uh, uh, mirror with this study on uh, short-term memory span in 1956, the paper is magical number seven plus minus two, some, some, and some more extension to the title, uh, that established that when we're dealing with this storage type of, at that time they didn't talk about working memory, about short-term memory only. <clears throat> so we can actually recall just seven, plus or minus two elements of information. That was represented essentially considered as the limits of short-term memory. Seven plus minus two <clears throat> minus five, between five and nine, like uh, telephone numbers containing the example. And that it could be, could be, could be stored working memory more or less easily. If it more than that, more than nine, you will have problems uh, recalling the telephone number uh, so it, because it exceeds its capacity. Uh, but however, when we're talking about working memory, not just short-term memories, in this case, we're talking about not only storage, but processing. Therefore, there is no any strict numbers that measure capacity, but 
in some studies, like a lot of studies, uh, 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 Nelson Holland did about this working memory capacity. So it's believed like, for example, four was was considered as a reasonable number for for capacity limitation, uh, considering that those now, that those elements should not only be stored but also processed and manipulated. So that takes some of the capacity as well. So, but generally speaking, I would say that if if you need to say what is a working memory capacity? I would say just a few items at a time. You can name exact number is four or whatever. Just a few could be three, could be four, or depending on situation, depending on 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 amount of processing required with those elements, not only storage. Okay. So what 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 make it difficult? It's amount of that processing. If if I ask you to do this task, on one side it looks like pretty simple. It's, it's not much information elements involved. It it it's easily within seven plus minus two, but it takes some time to answer because you need not only to manipulate that kind of store, but you have to do some processing, some sequence of numbers in certain order and so on, and that takes some capacity so we're talking about in this case elements that not isolated that you can process one at a time like some random chain of digits to, to recall we're talking about some elements that are interconnected and in this case this interconnection interaction between those elements of information make the task more difficult for working memory because processing those relations between elements would take additional capacity um, or even simpler task, the so-called transient interference problem that were used also to, 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 to study whether cognitive load or working memory load is most, most, most highest. So when we're talking like B is larger than C, it's, it's simple. It contains two elements, B and C, and, and, and some relation between them, the B larger than C. The same A larger than B, but if you need to ask, uh, uh, in sequence them all together, that makes it a little bit more difficult because you have more relations involved, more, more of those, and, and you have to consider them in working memory. So, uh, again, that make at that point of making that decision, the working memory load would be um, uh, higher. Uh, again, that's something that you wouldn't answer right immediately. You need some 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 time to. to, 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 to uh, that was about capacity, briefly. What about duration of working memory? Again, we, we, before we discussed that matter, essentially of seconds. So, uh, of course, on one side, if you rehearse something, you can rehearse it theoretically indefinitely. So you can you can repeat those telephone numbers in your mind, just 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 loop it, and then rehearse it for. It, Theoretically indefinitely, but that doesn't mean that your working memory is is indefinite in time, right? That you intentionally, in this case, rehearse and keep this in working memory. As soon as you stop rehearsing, you will lose. But in order to when to measure when people measure duration of working memory, they actually uh, excluded that uh, that rehearsal. So if we uh, uh, if we are not allowed to rehearse. That information would be lost in, 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 in a few seconds, essentially. So there were some studies that up to 20 seconds maximum, essentially. After that time, it would be completely lost. Um, so uh, how you how you how you subdue this rehearsing, for example, in some experiments, the people were asked while while actually trying to remember, recall some groups of three numbers only, three. Or letters or, digital, or or random numbers. They were also asked to do some secondary tasks, like like counting backward from some numbers. So that, that counting backward essentially uh, uh, excluded possibility of rehearsal of that main information. And in this case, only was actually pure duration of working memory was measured. And and that appeared to be again matter of seconds, no more than kind of again it depends on specific material, but but essentially. It was in, in those studies, some, some chain of digit objects, digit symbols were used. 
Uh, in other situations, it would be slightly different numbers and so on, but, but uh, roughly it's a matter of seconds, um, maybe 10 seconds, maximum 20 or something like that. But, but that, uh, again, like it's example, when you dial in a familiar telephone number, uh, if you're not rehearsed, if you're not allowed to rehearse, if you're not able to rehearse it in, in, in a few seconds, you will lose it. Okay, so uh, other things that uh, in working memory, we constantly, because the focus of attention shifting and, 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 and we constantly replace one information elements, replace with other and so on. So it's believed that forgetting actually, that losing an information occur uh, more, mostly due to this replacing of information, switching the focus. So I mean, that's that short term forgetting in this case. Um, anyway, so that's that briefly about characteristics of working memory capacity, limitation, and duration. That's what we need to we need to, to, to know from cognitive load perspective. It's it's limited in capacity in amount of information that we can process in the same time, and it's limited in duration for how long we can keep it. So a few items for a few seconds. That's kind of uh, uh, as a characteristic of working memory is its structure. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the battery contributed a lot with his group to, to studying the characteristic and structure of working memory still continues, and, and this structure has been extended. Uh, many of you possibly know, and uh, many, uh, some other elements were. Um, added, but essentially, in in uh, for, for for cognitive law theory, from cognitive law perspective, important is two things here. These two uh, uh, channels of working memory: visual and auditory. Let's call them very simple, like that. We don't need any specific terminology. What what we what we need to take out from from this structure that, that initial structure that was suggested that mid 70s so that includes some central executive which is control uh, uh, operation and switching attention between those two and coordination and to measure those uh, uh, slaves as are sometimes called from system one it's for processing visual information another auditory information uh, so if you for example uh, try to uh, count how many windows in your house now you can you can you can retrieve this information in your working memory and that would be visual working memory in this case and you can do this counting in your working memory like some manipulations of information you come up with answer so if you if you need to repeat some foreign words that you don't know and you heard from someone you can do it essentially again the repeating this but but holding it in in that auditory some auditory rehearsal that would be auditory channel. So anything that we hear is coming from uh, auditory buffer of sensory memory coming into auditory channel of working memory from visual uh, sensory memory coming into visual channel of working memory. In cognitive load theory, we not really talk much about central executive. Even though there are a lot of studies generally, and the important studies which is investigate this kind of executive function and, 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 and role of that in, in, in students' learning and so on, but, but that's not part of mainstream of cognitive load theory. In cognitive load theory, the view on this is pretty simplistic. There's two channels, visual and auditory, they are both limited, but there is a two channels. There's that important thing. What is the central executive? We don't talk much about that. Uh, uh, there is even actually a point of view in cognitive low theory, in, in, in theoretical point of view, uh, that, that we don't even need this, this specific executive functioning as such because a knowledge base in long term memory, this knowledge structures in long term memory perform this executive role. So if you have some knowledge structures in long-term memory, you, you operate in familiar environment in this case, you have the knowledge base about that environment. That would essentially would direct your attention. So you didn't need any kind of additional central control that would be controlling your, your attention and so on. 
that, that so essentially there is an argument that theoretically we actually don't even need this component in in working memory uh, because we already have this uh, uh, information store that knowledge base that essentially performs this function so um <clears throat> but that that was a kind of theoretical argument what is important here uh, is that the when we have because we have two these channels each limited in capacity and duration but when we use both we potentially can increase this sort of working memory capacity so that's that important from point of view of that's kind of and as a basis of pretty much multimedia learning argument that we if we use two channels when we split information into those two channels, we will be able to potentially effectively increase working memory capacity because we use two channels instead of one. Rather than channeling everything in one, we can split it and, and in this case increase effective working memory capacity. So out from this <clears throat> brief description of characteristic of working memory, we can make some already some instructional implications. Even before we're talking about any cognitive load consideration. So firstly, just just said what was before about this dual channeling. Uh, so it's better to use the dual modality, visual and auditory present information in, in, in both rather than in one because it potentially could increase working memory capacity and make it make learning easier uh, because working memory is 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 limited in capacity it's better to to minimize any irrelevant material any interference any any distraction any other activities that's not related to learning goal but would take capacity of working memory, limited capacity, distract attention on something else. So that obvious uh, uh, consequence again, also. So uh, considering limitation of working memory, we need also in this case, better to provide some adequate time for, for processing because working memory is, is limited. So in this case, we need this, uh, take this factor into consideration we need to present something for longer time so the student not just limited but but that sort of um, um the duration of their working memory processing something when we permanently presented in front of them would make it and not not taken away immediately uh, would would make learning easier because if you take it away that they have to keep it in, in working memory and capacity and duration is limited and they wouldn't be able to do that um uh, uh, successfully so um, other things that again so if your instruction uh, require students to make many inferences on their own so you present something and, and you assume that something else would be uh, the students would would, would 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 come up on their own just making some inferences like this so not presented everything explicitly that also could could essentially overload working memory it, it wouldn't reduce working memory because you might think, oh, yeah, I presented a little bit and, and, and everything else might they come up themselves, but I present a little bit, so therefore working memory would be, would be within working memory capacity. But in fact, that additional reasoning required for, would consume those additional um, required uh, working memory capacity even more and make even more difficult and overloads working memory in this way. So again, uh, not, 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 not good, good good way to, to, to instruct. So uh, this kind of uh, in few instructional implications that we can we can think about that just based on this working memory characteristic, not yet even talking about some cognitive load. But if we're talking about cognitive load, so cognitive load is nothing else but working memory load that according to the cognitive load theory. So uh, it, it's it's just simple like that. Cognitive load is, is working memory load. So essentially it means that that working memory capacity is that required for performing a particular task. So cognitive load required or imposed by a particular task, that would be 
that working memory capacity, essentially, which was that task would take. So uh, if we if we talk about what actually what 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 produces most of that uh, uh, load, uh, those interacting element of information, interactive, not only element by itself, but relation between them, interactivity. So something that you can learn one item at a time doesn't really impose cognitive load or working memory load. So we may talk, for example, a situation um, uh, when, when we need to learn a long vocabulary list. Could be a difficult task by itself, but it's not heavy, not difficult because it's heavy cognitive load. Because you can learn one item at a time, one item translated in a time and so on. What when you learn the grammar of foreign language? Could be just few elements there, but they are heavily interconnected by those relations between them in, in grammar. And that would make task difficult, even though number of elements itself would be would be limited. Therefore, most important thing is 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 actually this interaction between elements, not just number of elements by itself to learn. So uh, other thing that important to, to, to keep in mind that working memory <coughs> is always cognitive load is working memory load in the current moment when you do some task. It's not some kind of cumulative load over some long long period of time or, or the amount of information that you need to process. What you're doing at this current moment and what makes it difficult to process or to learn, that it would be cognitive load. Uh, uh, therefore, so cognitive load and working memory load and co cognitive load, now we're talking about cognitive load generally. So it, it's some kind of local characteristic what is happening at this moment. What makes task difficult at this specific moment when you process it? Not, not just retrospectively, generally, later, over long periods of time, and so on. Therefore, again, we come back to, to, to measurement of cognitive load. So the most important measure of cognitive load are those methods that could actually capture this working memory load at the current moment. Therefore, many measures of cognitive load, even though we use them, but they're not really, very strictly speaking, uh, adequate, I would say, or, or best, because they rely on some kind of retrospection over long periods of time and so on. They, they can give you some general, possibly, uh, uh, measures and, and some uh, idea about how difficult something. But, but to measure specifically cognitive load, you need some techniques that measure at this current kind of moment. Uh, and about measurement, I, 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 I have a few few words uh, later and, and, and uh, make some reference. Um, so uh, I myself was at some stage was thinking about how to best define cognitive load uh, considering those many factors that involved. It's not only of course, not 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 number of elements that, that we already know. Uh, relation between them that important interactions, uh, but it also these uh, time factors coming into in, which which should, which not 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 frequently considered the time factor of uh, time limitation, the duration limitation of working memory. Uh, again, that should be somehow taken into account, and that normally not. Not, 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 not consider it really that people focus on, on capacity usually, uh, how many elements and interaction between them. But if you take everything into consideration, and also the fact that you, you cannot always clearly outline what is the element really. If, if, the, if something, there is a task that we can clearly see that element, that element, that, that we're processing, but it's not always possible as well. There is some activities going on in working memory when we consciously process something. That, that's very difficult sometimes even 
define like some kind of element or describe as a, as an element, but they're still happening. So you you can activate some knowledge, you can you can do some other kind of thing, uh, which is also potentially consume working memory capacity. So I personally <coughs> come up with some definition of cognitive load as the intensity intensity of information processing in working memory within the time frame of working memory operation. Time frame that a matter of seconds that important from point of view of duration. So intensity, how much per unit of time? Because sometimes could be slow processing, and that may be quite a distance. Sometimes could be a lot of information per, with that within that limited amount of time. So I would say the idea of intensity of information processing in working memory, from my perspective, describe this idea of, of cognitive load, maybe a little bit more adequate, but but again, it, it's not it's not easier to measure than the elements again so there is some kind of a little bit problem here with the definition of how we how we measure how we describe things in, <clears throat> until now we usually try to describe in cognitive load this in terms of elements so elements of nation interactive elements but 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 it, there is some limitations of, of, of that approach to some degree because not everything could be described as elements. Not, 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 not always you can clearly define what that element is uh, in many cases. Uh, so in some cases, we maybe that intensity will be better. But on the other side, that, that doesn't make it easier to, 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 to describe uh, because a lot of activities that you, you cannot actually quantitatively, but sometimes even qualitatively, uh, um, uh, in, including in your count or in your measure. Therefore, again, the measurement is kind of a, a issue that's very important and uh, uh, and and uh, ongoing. There's a lot of uh, 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 a lot of discussion and so on. So, uh, just very briefly. There would be in a couple of weeks Fred Pass here, right? And we'll be talking about measurement, to my understanding. He is a, the best expert in this topic because he came up with the first measure of, of cognitive load. It is as the subjective um, uh, uh, reports. Uh, so, and he's going to talk here about measures. So, I, I'm not going to talk about measurement almost at all at this talk. That would be this presentation by. Fred about that would be comprehensive about the current state of affairs in this sort of uh, area of cognitive load here. Yeah, just to mention a few things that normally we speak about objective measures, which is uh, 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 some that measure it from kind of outside of, of person. There's a, using some devices like psychophysiological or performing some asking person to perform the second task and measuring actually result of performance, objective result of performance in this, in this case uh, as a, some indicator of, uh, of cognitive load. But there is also used subjective measure. Uh, th these are still most commonly used because they are simple, just rating scales, asking subjects to rate their uh, feeling of that kind of task difficulty or mental effort. Even here, the terminology, there is some difference. Some people ask how easy or difficult this task is to perform and interpret it as a measure of cognitive load. Some asking how much mental effort you, that the task involved, or you extended to do this task or something like that. Uh, something like, for example, this type of measurement the students have to, or participants have to click on whether it is or difficult on a scale between nine point scale in this case, extremely easy to extremely difficult. And, and, and this is used as a interpreted as a measure of cognitive load. And to some degree, those measures work and, and still working and give us some, some idea in, in, in this interpretation. But, but of course, with the development of cognitive theory, we need to gradually to switch to more comprehensive, to more, more exact. And, and by the way, some of those 
uh, objective measures used on modern sort of technique and modern devices are more adequate because they many of them actually measure how the load adds that specific moment which is most important not, not just retrospectively like this subject we rating sometimes we ask the post task how easy or difficult is that task was and and that not exactly showing at that at what specific moment that task was difficult it could be difficult not always but some specific moment some specific time during the task performance and not at other times and and and, and that this this measure of course wouldn't answer but some others could therefore they could be used and should be used more uh, more intensely uh, okay so next uh, about uh, types of cognitive load so cognitive load theory it's it's not just 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 as simple as kind of working memory load and it's if it's if it working memory is overloaded it is it, it, it's always bad and we can get rid of that if you get rid of that you will learn nothing because if working memory is not loaded as there is not working memory load that means nothing happening there's no learning happening so learning always require um, working memory load or cognitive load the other thing is that that load could be essential for learning or wasteful so therefore two major type of cognitive load is distinguished this in between in, in cognitive load theory one is so-called intrinsic cognitive load meaning the intrinsic to the instructional goal so it's kind of useful uh, in other words useful or productive load which is relevant to, to 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 achieving specific learning goals so again that that obviously determined by the uh, relations between those elements with the degree of element interactivity and again i'm talking about element interactivity here as more kind of uh, the simple kind of uh, approach um, and of course it also depends on learner prior knowledge that's something that we're going to talk about in more details uh, I wouldn't say later but probably definitely next 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 lecture in, in the, 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 the whole lecture about that kind of knowledge and structures but uh, but depends on learner prior knowledge and what factor so intrinsic cognitive load which is a uh, relevant that, that that if we if we achieve some um, learning goals so we we'll learn something that load need to be experienced so that important load without that load the learning goal would not be achieved so that's essential load. Uh, on the other side there is some wasteful and productive or as they say in cognitive load extraneous cognitive load extraneous to the goal of instruction so something that irrelevant to achieving the specific goal and just uh, uh, just existing because the task designed in a way that require some type of activities that are not really relevant to learning um, uh, or information presented in a way that again require learners to to do something that not really essential for this for learning this specific material or achieving this specific learning goal uh, I, I we will see a, a lot of examples shortly but firstly those kind of definitions uh, so that load of course depends on on instructional design how you design the task how you present how you select the learning task and and, and so on so these two types of load intrinsic plus extraneous that actually what is total cognitive load consider it um, uh, before I go I need to mention something because if, if if you read about cognitive load and some publications you probably <coughs> wondering where you, you, you probably saw some this uh, concept of germane cognitive load also uh, in many papers uh, that's that obvious that that always uh, talking also about germane cognitive load uh, I would say from from my perspective and, I, and I, I'm, I'm arguing about that uh, for some time already uh, and, and John Sweller also uh, have a similar 
view. We, we, we don't really, not, that concept essentially is redundant in a way. We, we, don't, we don't need it theoretically because everything that that concept uh, add to cognitive law theory could be included and described within the concept of intrinsic cognitive law. But in this case, you need to clearly specify instructional goal. So germane cognitive law, just to, to briefly describe uh, for those who don't know it, it's some, some additional cognitive law, usually interpreted as some additional cognitive law. So intrinsic is some essential that basic learning of the concept, but <clears throat> germane is something that makes learning much more um, uh, effective. For example, uh, allow you to transfer to other uh, type of task, so increase kind of transfer, make uh, learning more uh, successful and so on. Uh, for example, uh, you can say that if you increase, you can, you can, you can, you can teach using the same type of task uh, persistently, you know, uh, not varying the task much. And in this case, students will learn the basic concept. But if you vary the task, uh, they use the different variations of the specific learning task, present you can expect the students would be uh, the, the not, not le learning would be more kind of uh, successful meaning that students possibly could transfer knowledge to a slightly different situations they will be more flexible kind of knowledge and that attributed to even though load will increase for this variability of tasks but that was called in germane cognitive loads so are the essential uh, but on the other side <clears throat> in the you, you can similarly describe this uh, by calling it intrinsic flow, but for achieving a higher level of, 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 of learning goal. So your, your goal could be just learning basic concept on, a, on, on to, to the level where you can just reproduce this concept and show the understanding. On the other side, you can say my goal actually, or learning goals that you want your students to achieve is, is not only achieving the basic understanding, but uh, ability to apply that concept in a, in a more different sort of situation. So you can, you can actually put it into your instructional goals at high level. And that would require additional means. And that would be that would be covered normally by German public law. Therefore, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about that concept and I don't use it at all because I believe that you need to clearly identify a specified instructional goal and, and then the intrinsic load that would work something that would be required to achieve in that goal. And that would consume whatever that germane cognitive load is, 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 is talked about. Uh, so uh, just to finish with this, so what we, from, from point of view of cognitive load theory, so efficient learning, what is kind of efficient learning? So achieves, to make learning efficient, we need to manage um, cognitive load so we need we need to manage intrinsic cognitive load productive we need to manage it not always reduce sometimes we need to increase it because that is relevant load and on the other side so how we can do this different ways we can we can if we need to reduce it we can simplify task uh, we can omit some of those uh, tasks initially we will look at some techniques shortly uh, segment a uh, segment task properly so we can manage that essential intrinsic cognitive load in different ways and different techniques some of those techniques we all use for, for so it's not no, no, not any kind of a specific discovery of cognitive load theory those techniques are used for, for, for a long time but that's something that we can manage cognitive load on the other side we need to minimize extraneous cognitive load so if not excluded Completely. So we need to try to minimize waste, always minimize extraneous, but manage intrinsic. Sometimes we need to increase it by if the task is too simple for learners, we might need to increase it to make it more, more challenging if there is still capacity available. So we need to manage, not or, uh, in many cases, we need to uh, uh, also reduce it just to, 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 to so learners would be not overloaded by this intrinsic cognitive load. Not speaking even about explaining. So <clears throat> if it's if 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 that intrinsic load is low, 
so the task is too simple, too easy for learners. Then on one side, we can say that we might possibly need to increase it to, to make it more challenging and interesting. But on, on the other side also, uh, we might say that we not to be, we don't need to do anything with extraneous cognitive work. No, no waste time of reducing because the task is already too simple. So no matter if there is even some extraneous cognitive load, there's no point of, 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 of handling it because the cognitive, the working memory would not be overloaded anyway. So that may point that cognitive load theories, usually all these techniques or methods is, should be applied when we're talking about situation of, of relatively high intrinsic cognitive load. The tasks are relatively difficult because if it's too simple, nothing needs to be done really to, to not, not to work worthwhile actually any effort. If something is really becoming difficult, intrinsic cognitive load is becoming uh, high, then, then we need to do something to, to, to manage uh, overall total cognitive load by reducing that extremes. So general rules in this case, we can say here, so uh, don't do anything that gets in the way of learning. So extraneous cognitive load is something that gets in the way of learning. Okay, so we don't need to do that. We need to exclude it. So uh, uh, intrinsic cognitive load is something that really is the way of learning. So we need to manage it properly and 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 and, uh, and, and in this way, so we'll see the learning goal is achieved efficiently. So um, some sources of just few examples. What, what, what can cause that? Let's talk about this wasteful, extraneous cognitive load. So what would just again to list few items? So again, some few obvious items, obvious kind of examples. Uh, just too many new elements information working memory is reducing that that would something that makes working memory overloaded if it's unnecessarily too many elements information if it's necessarily if it's part of intrinsic cognitive load then then we need to do something to reduce that intrinsic cognitive load but we're now talking about extraneous so sometimes we introduce some unnecessarily too many elements so some we sometimes using that kind of whistle and bells for example, in, in a presentation that distract attention, introduce some additional elements that are not really relevant to the point, and, and, and that overload working memory. <clears throat> uh, oh, I was... um, others, other things that we will talk about that uh, when we will talk about problem solving more, but even uh, later today, Something that require extensive search and match processes. So uh, it's not could be directly relevant to the learning, but students are required to required to, to do some searching, the matching some elements of in one uh, part of the instruction with another part of instruction and so on. Those type of activities consume cognitive load, consume working memory capacity, but on the other side, they might not be directly relevant to learning, therefore they would be extraneous. But, 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 but again, that would produce some source of that uh, extraneous cognitive load. Um, again, a few examples would be shortly specific. Um, another thing, some insufficient guidance for novice learners. Uh, again, similar to that point that we discussed before, when many, many inferences we require students to do. The novice learners, they might not handle new information without additional guidance. If the guidance is not provided, essentially the learners would be involved in some uh, reasoning uh, processes, some searching processes, problem solving search, random problem, try and trial and error, and other things that, again, we're going to talk about those when we talk about problem solving in one of the lectures. But, um, Something that could also introduce unnecessary cognitive load in this case. That would be unnecessary in this case because it, those activities could be not directly related to learning. And therefore, they treat it as extraneous. Um, just, just one glance of this 
on this presentation, I, I, I just example of some uh, screenshot of simulations that clearly introduce too many things to handle and at that time. So you, you, you don't you don't need to, to, to be much of the expert to say that probably this, these presentations violate <clears throat> most of those things and could be and, and could not be very good, especially for for relative novices. The, uh, uh, too many things need to be processed at the same time, even this kind of switching um, uh, the type of view, analogical or, 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 or uh, actually factual, those could be, could be uh, uh, also switching attention and, and, and a lot of information. Uh, just, just quick example of potentially uh, uh, deficient presentations that could overload working memory. Um, we'll look at some specific techniques shortly. Again, before that, let's look at, at, at some schematic view of how we handle, in this case, um, those type of different type of situation in cognitive load theory. So uh, again, it's very kind of schematic view. Uh, it's, it's not very, if not possible at all, to, to, to quantify all these things and, 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 and say that in this case you have uh, some type of load uh, uh, excessive or, or not. We, we don't get the quantitative measure for this. But theoretically, uh, schematically, we can present the space. Let, let, let's say that we have some intrinsic and extraneous, some specific type of task and learner, and we have intrinsic, some extraneous cognitive load. And here, and specific learner that outlines this capacity of working memory by, 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 by this sort of rectangle. So if we have this situation uh, when both intrinsic and extraneous load together are within this working memory capacity, then it's no overload situation. It's everything is more or less okay. We don't need to do anything in this case. So if we have a situation when uh, uh, when you see the total co cognitive load excessive, it's 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 always a working memory capacity. So in this case, of course, we need to reduce extraneous cognitive load because intrinsic is irrelevant. We, we don't need to do anything with that. We can reduce the total cognitive load by reducing irrelevant extraneous cognitive load. So the cognitive load approach here would be reduce extraneous at least to the limit that, to the point when it, everything would be within this working memory red rectangle capacity. All right, let's say that we reduce it completely. So there is no any extraneous cognitive load, but intrinsic cognitive load within the working memory capacity, but there is some underused working memory capacity. Potentially, we can increase intrinsic cognitive load here. So make the task a little bit more challenging, more difficult. So that would be a case when we need to manage intrinsic load by actually increasing it up to the point when when the working memory capacity is is is, is used but not exceeded. Uh, we can we can get uh, just involved in this too much and then again increase the cognitive increase the task difficulty too much, which is exceeds the working memory capacity. So in this case, we will need again to, to reduce that intrinsic cognitive load. By re, 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 manage it by reducing. So in this case, this situation, we need to reduce cognitive load. So uh, this is kind of a schematic, of course, but they show like what what, they, what type of actions uh, are advised according to this cognitive load theory uh, view of different types of load that we need to do in different kind of situations. Uh, now let's look at some specific examples. A few few examples that show your specific techniques, uh, how that uh, cognitive load is handled. Uh, mostly we're going to talk about extraneous, but uh, one or two examples will be on, on, on intrinsic as well. This is so-called split attention situations. When, when the learners are, by the way of presentation, 
the task presenting, the learners are required to do this kind of searching and matching that I um, mentioned before as a source of extraneous cognitive load. Like this as diagram and 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 uh, and and it related sort of textual um, the verbal materials are separated in space. So in order to make sense out of this task, the learners have to do this matching and searching. Every time they need to, while they looking at the diagram, they need to go to the text, find the place in the text that describes that specific point, go back to the diagram, uh, see how that sort of relates, and go back to the text and so on. So you need to, to do this. That would require this holding of information in working memory while searching, and that will potentially overload working memory. So those activities, searching and matching, is not really relevant to, to learning here. The learning here is to understanding um, the specific kind of task, but, but we are, but the learners would be uh, forced to do this um, uh, searching and matching and holding intermediates of holding information and working memory while the search and imagine because of, of design of the task of presentation. So we, we, extraneous cognitive load could be reduced here possibly by um, by embedded embedding some of that textual verbal information within the diagram and then simultaneously actually excluding some some uh, really redundant part of, of, of text as well. So something that could be done by, by this way, but steps could be clearly presented also one, two, and, and so on. And, and specific operations, specific um, um, uh, actions here would be embedded within the diagram. So this kind of physical integration sometimes integrated. So that was one of the, one of the first techniques that was investigated by this cognitive load theory. Uh, 30 years ago, some, some of these examples that we come up with this idea that one that a source of extraneous cognitive loads that need to be reduced in this in this way. There was a lot of um, <coughs> studies within in, in, in this so-called split attention effect uh, in cognitive load theory. So as many these so split attention situations, uh, for example, Typical like that shown for the diagram uh, with some textual statements. Um, in case where then no diagram, no text are intelligible on their own. So they need to be related. If they're intelligent on their own, you can just drop one of those uh, parts uh, and, and use only diagram, only text. But if they heavily rely on each other and not understandable without each other, in this case, that diagram makes sense without the textual explanation. In this case, we have this split attention situation because students have to search and merge. So understanding requires this search and matching. So um, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, it, it should be diagram and text. Could be any two sources of information. Could be, could, could be two pieces of text that relate to each other but separated. Or, or, or diagram and table, or text and table, a different kind of situation where investigated uh, the different types of uh, of material, different types of information sources. If they are separated in space, but need this mental integration, uh, that that could be source of split attention, and, and, and in this case, finding the way to integrate them, embed them, could potentially help. So we're talking about this split attention effect when the physically integrating those sources would potentially alleviate this reduced cognitive load, extraneous cognitive load and improve learning. So a lot of kind of studies done into this effect with different situations with different sources that show that actually it's working. Uh, so some, some a little bit unusual case I'm providing here that from those studies that were done uh, in this, uh, how that embedding could be done. This is a the, the task from uh, from kinematics essentially uh, uh, showing the task statement and then uh, uh, the few lines of solutions actually right uh, again that could be related as a, a split source uh, format could, could could be could be regarded because every time you, you you're looking at this uh, solution line you you may go back to the uh, task statement to see what 
what, what those parameters are and what the task statement is. So it, it could potentially cause the source uh, could split attention. So some some very unusual way of uh, embedding here was suggested like this. So in actually embedded solution within within the task statement. So well, the task statement should be presented firstly like the task statement itself. And then the secondly, the task statement should be repeated, but already with the, with the, with the, with the, with the solution steps embedded within. So to, to, to reduce any potential this searching and matching activities that could be uh, irrelevant in this case. Uh, so any sort of multiple representations that you use frequently in different instructional presentation uh, in, in, in hypertext, for example, environment, computer-based, a lot of situations that could generally generate this split attention situation that could increase extraneous cognitive load. Um, uh, in this case, integrated them physically would, would be a way of, of dealing with, uh, with that extraneous cognitive load. Also, some, uh, 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 sometimes we, we, have, we have situation when you, you click on something on the computer and, and some new information appear, which is on top of what it was before, which is relevant to this. So it cover information, some feedback, for example, appeared on the solution. And, and, and cover what was the solution itself. And you have to keep in mind that solution in your working memory. Again, the source of uh, split attention potentially. So any any of these kind of uh, type of design techniques that would reduce this need to hold information this is unnecessarily temporarily in working memory and reduce this search and match could potentially be useful and relevant. Uh, to, to, to illustrate another technique, I just using some not really quite instructional uh, uh, example, but let's say you get a map uh, and, and, and showing how to get from one point to another point in, in New York City in this case, and with some uh, arrows and some explanations what to do at, at each point. So on the other side, we can simply present something like that. And when you're driving and using this type of guidance, the probably those um, explanations would be in a way unnecessary that distract you from driving. And, and, and that, that one would be pretty much sufficient when you drive in a car or walking actually in it from that point to another. So, so that's just illustrating that not everything is really essential and necessary to perform the task. Uh, something in this case, those explanations are essentially redundant. So out of those two, probably one without any explanation would be more useful and more easy to, 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 to use. All these uh, textual commentaries would be redundant. So we're talking about that redundancy here. So if, if something is intelligible on its own, like that diagram only, without any text, then we probably should use that information, that source of information only, and not add anything else that would increase working memory load in this case. It's not just kind of innocent, so the, the more it's, it's okay, so it wouldn't be harmful. Actually, adding some redundant information would consume working memory resources, and that make it essentially harmful because uh, the task would become the, your, your cognitive processing will require more kind of working memory uh, capacity, which could be potentially used for something else, something more relevant activity. So this is essentially example of redundancy, in fact, a, a redundancy situation. <clears throat> some uh, street directories, some pie charts, for example, are self-explanatory. And, and still many, uh, many people just do the commentary on them. They, they, they provide the pie charts with those clear segments indicating what what the, what, 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 what the parameters are. Uh, and, and, and still a lot of text around talking about what is what is more or, or less and so on. And, and clearly this explanation is redundant because this pie chart normally self-explanatory. So many other examples 
of that redundancy. In instructional situation, it happens as well very frequently. So if it's if it's self-explanatory, just keep it the source alone. There's no need to any additional other source that will explain it because that redundant source would be not really harm, not, not really innocent, we could possibly could be harmful for many. So uh, one example of, of this situation is learning from user manual. So we have a lot of those manuals when we learning about some uh, uh, hardware or sometimes how, how to use uh, some software on a computer or something. So you follow in the instruction in a manual and um, uh, usually that manual could be separate kind of like book or, uh, or could be put on, on a screen, but you have to follow the instruction. You can follow that, do something on the screen or you can pay attention to the actual device, whatever it's TV or any other sort of equipment. So many of those type of situations include both split attention and redundancy because you use a lot of sources of information here. It could be that manual itself, some the hardware uh, that you can actually do something in it or you do something on that screen and do the something on typing on keyboard. You have to switch your attention between different sources of information and, and some of those could possibly reduce that split attention because you have to split attention between some of those sources of information and some of those could possibly be redundant because they already uh, represent it in one form. For example, many of those manuals have some pictures or diagrams or any form of presentation of that hardware or or that uh, um, uh, or that software kind of components, and you on the other side you look at it the same in in actual uh, uh, form, whether it's actual uh, device hardware or actual some software on the computer screen. Or something. So you have several sources that pretty much repeat the same. You have to split attention and you have to to, to attend to redundant. So <clears throat> a lot of this type of split attention and redundancy situation could be that. So what was suggested here in some studies that kind of integrated manual only uh, could be in printed form or on screen, but integrated meaning that split attention is eliminated by embedding some textual explanation into the pictures um, could be sufficient, at least initially. The hardware could be redundant, for example. So uh, what it says, in a way, counterintuitively, that in many situations, but not in all situations, not like those in a, in, in a fine print, <coughs> where, where the actual equipment is essential and you learn to type or something like that. But in many situations, the learning will be more efficient when you, at least initially, you read that manual with a explanation embedded into the pictures to reduce split attention and not attending to actual equipment. So you just follow in the manual. You, you yourself, you might try it. I, I, I did with the complex equipment when you get something and, and you want to lose whatever it's, let's say some, 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 some new TV or, or new, new device uh, that you need to, you need to do. When I read the manual first, at least run through it and have some idea first without going to that actual equipment. It, it helps to learn when you get through that manual, you have some initial idea what's gonna, what's gonna be done and so on. And then on the second stage, you go to the equipment and, and, and then you try to do that with the help of manual or without. And, and that simplified task, rather than you do have all that equipment and, and the manual with explanation all at the same time. So you could be overloaded here and, and some elimination of redundancy, at least initial initial and initial stage could be useful and to attention. So there's some kind of examples that were in, that were investigated of, of this technique. Uh, what the implications? Avoid any redundant and necessary. Uh, graphics, uh, some unnecessary stories, and unnecessary uh, text 
again an example of that mathematical word problem that sometimes describes too 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 many uh, things that not really relevant to the task itself to the kind of contextual things that could distract attention is not really necessary uh, some uh, some comments that if we have low element interactivity simple materials then as we discussed before extraneous cognitive load really wouldn't matter whether it's high or low because the task is simple as that therefore no no effect were actually demonstrated in those areas it's only for relatively more complex tasks repetition is not redundancy so if you you for example you 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 do some task and and, and then you later you repeat so that you have in a different form for example the same task represented it's not would be redundant activity redundancy when you have two sources at the same time when you when you do some repetition it could be some source later or separated later in time so it, it would be something that imposing this additional cognitive load so uh, again there are some points that could be could be uh, important in some cases so general uh, rule is that if the source of information that you are dealing with are unintelligible in isolation they need to be related to each other to be understood then you have to embed them and try to integrate them to reduce split attention is if they are actually um, intelligible in isolation each of those sources then eliminate unnecessary redundant ones so the things actually depend on whether it's intelligible and so on or not so in, in, in according to that situation we can we can do either uh, split attention kind of situation uh, uh, actions or or, or redundancy uh, uh, about uh, modality uh, again we already started talking about these dual uh, presentations and as an example I, I need to mention a little bit about that too um, when using two channels of working memory instead of one should they, should we present everything in a, in a visual form or something in the visual and something in auditory so in this case we're talking about some uh, animation with this screenshot in one case uh, uh, auditory explanation is presented um, uh, explanation is presented and as, as an auditory narration in the first case in a, in a, in the top and then the bottom actually the it's, it's only visual is the textual explanation is embedded in printed form within the uh, within the each screen each each each, each uh, uh, like in the bottom so uh, as on screen text so which is better so uh, according to this dual channel processing that we discussed before so effective working memory capacity could be um could be effective working memory capacity could be increased so uh, uh, auditory presentations uh, from that perspective should be better because it's channeling information into two different um, uh, uh, processing so the ways and, and uh, working memory capacity could be effectively increased also what it would do it would reduce split attention because in this case in the bottom you see the text separated from picture in a way it could cause some split attention kind of situation uh, if it's presented in auditory form there's no split attention you're listening to the explanations and you see the text no no really visual split attention here so that was kind of modality effects that was established again by a lot of by uh, Richard Meyer research a long time ago that showed that <clears throat> uh, again modality effect took place only when the sources of information are non-redundant when they are redundant then, then just eliminate redundant sources and just use one but if they're non-redundant then better to present in different uh, form uh, there are also some uh, geometry diagrams uh, with the auditory and uh, on screen and on and printed text were investigated here some in electrical engineering with uh, diagrams electric environment diagrams and so on so implications are again so if possible use the audio narration rather than on screen text uh, whether it's a printed graphic if animation the similar way but frame by frame narrations rather than on screen textual um, important point here could be also 
to 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 make sure that you use some kind of indicators of what you are talking currently about when it's like computer based presentations so you you you're talking about some part of the diagram but students might wonder where exactly you are talking about now so you need to use some cues actually to to, to direct attention some kind of possibly highlighting on a diagram could be used or some some flashing or, or in this case flashing would be useful because if you use it as a, as, a, as a whistles and bells in many cases people using presentations that, that would be not useful could be redundant but but here that could be as a as a, as a, as a kind of cueing which the direct attention that's important to 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 to, to for this um, uh, modality effect uh, effectiveness uh, again, those two sources should be uh, unintelligible without each other. That important point. Element interactivity must be high, so that should be a relatively complex task. When simple task, then it doesn't matter which technique you are using. Uh, again, that queuing is essential, or signaling sometimes called. One, 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 one important point. Auditory text should not be too long. What's happening with a with, with a long pieces of text? We 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 come into another effect here. Is it called the transient information effect? The auditory information, auditory uh, information presentation have the transient nature. What you're hearing now will disappear in a few seconds. <coughs> if something that I'm talking about that I will be talking about in a few seconds would be essential for understanding what I'm talking about now. Then, if the, my, my, my speech is too long, you will, be, you, you will need to, to, to keep in your working memory, in your auditory working memory, what was said before, to be able to make sense of everything. If it's too long, that could be difficult. Your working memory could be all over it. So if the auditory text is too long, related to some specific issue is, is is better to present it in printed form or in screen form because that one would be permanent and learners could go back anytime even if you present long piece of auditory text in spoken form that could cause working memory overload because of that transiency and the students could uh, could uh, lose track actually what you were talking about to, to make some sense out of this so therefore in auditory presentations, in auditory explanation, better to be short, have, have them brief, no, not too long. If you necessarily need to be too long and the text is too long, that 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 could be should be probably presented better as a screen text, <coughs> even though that contradicts this uh, kind of modality effect. But that kind of talk in, in other uh, <clears throat> Okay, some shortly about briefly some another. So uh, isolated interactive, that is essentially about managing um, intrinsic cognitive load in this case. So <laughs> when we have complex material, intrinsically complex, that need to be learned. So what sometimes is, 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 is useful to do, to present initially <coughs> that complex material as a set of isolated elements without, uh, without explaining the relations between them. But that on the second phase, to present them all, all together already in a full form with full interactions. Uh, that technique was actually demonstrated to be uh, uh, effective, but on a, on a way it, it's counterintuitive because when we present something about without connections, we're talking about actually rote learning here. So something learning, something without understanding because for understanding you need to understand relations, connections between those component or part, but you're presenting them separately here without explaining those connections. So that makes learning essentially, you, you wrote learn first, and then you learn with understanding next. Still, this rote learning actually have some place in instruction, because that could be useful in some cases, because that allow us to form some, some kind of initial partial if you look, knowledge already that could help to deal with the complexity on the second phase. So some example here is shown 
which, which not actually used in in some experimental study on this effect, but just to illustrate. So you have some explanation of some nomograms here. Again, counting is not relevant. Just to just to to, to make some quick example. There is some steps here that should be done to use this nomogram for solving this task. So what what you can do initially, you can just present the names of these steps without explaining them, just to give the students idea what what would follow. You have some initial idea, initial knowledge, some rudimentary, if you like, knowledge of what will follow here and what is involved. And that on the net, on the second phase, you can present clicking on all of these steps, you got some details explanation of, of which step, which is uh, obviously interconnected. What's done before would follow uh, would follow up in the next step and so on. So again, these techniques essentially uh, uh, allow to uh, reduce load by acquiring some partial basic sort of knowledge uh, uh, about the situations that would be useful in the subsequent year. So, this is just a quick example of the <clears throat> isolated interactive, meaning you present first isolated and then secondly as a in, in, inter, in full interactive. This was shown to be the efficient technique for, for novice learners. For novices, because the task is difficult for them and, and, and that will be helpful for them. If you already have some knowledge, probably that will be not a uh, not useful technique. Okay, so we finished with in, a, in a five minutes about some talk about evolutionary evolutionary points of view. Why, uh, why have we always this limited working memory capacity? What, what, what is the point of it? What are the advantages of that? From, from point of view of those principles that we discussed, five principles of natural information processing system, uh, one thing's already coming out because it says that uh, working memory implements this mechanism for limited changes to, to knowledge base. Like, like this random mutation are always in biology always small, which is prevent from uh, from from quick growth of of, 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 of organism or things or, or whatever like uh, cancer or, or something like that. The similar by analogy thing is here working memory limits the changes to knowledge base in long term memory by preventing those huge uh, um, <clears throat> changes which will not be handled. Uh, so uh, there is another consideration, kind of combinatorial. So uh, let's imagine that we have completely new situations that we need to, to handle. Some past uh, that we, we have no knowledge. Again, it's 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 very it's very uh, no, not no, not quite a realistic assumption because we always have something in our knowledge base. As, as we discussed last week, we have some biological primary knowledge available at least uh, sometimes relevant to some situations. But but let's assume that we don't have nothing, new knowledge, and we have to handle some some task with some uh, number of components available. In this case, we don't have knowledge. We need to handle it randomly. We need to take some combinations and see if it's that solve the task. And, and then if not, we can do another type of uh, combination of those elements or some actions and see trial and error essentially or some similar random search technique. That's the only way we can do because we don't have any knowledge of, of, of situation. So if we have the number of elements, if we have just a few elements of those that we that we ca can handle, that possibly makes this task doable by randomly. And we come up with, with some solution. If the number of elements increases, that could make very difficult and how difficult that yeah, as a mathematicians you can you can calculate some like the possible number of, of possible combination of permutation if you have just three elements the the possible number of of all combination of that would be six that's three factorial even six right so that's that manageable so you have like some a b c that, that you have a b c a b b c c a and, and so there's this limited number of combinations, right? Could be only six possible. If you have 10, not significantly higher than three, 
is just 10 components. Looks like not much, but essentially, theoretically, it makes those over 3 million possible combinations. So it's not practically to handle any of those from this perspective. So we can say that we evolved to have this working memory limited in this forceful way that we are, would be not able to handle more than or those few elements at the same time. And that would make us to, 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 to handle possibly the situation and, 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 and come up with some solution, especially if it's evolutionary critical situation. So the nature artificially, forcefully limits the number of elements that we are able to, to, to handle in what in memory to enable us to at least come up with some solution. Maybe those elements, some of them could be essentially some of those elements that free those, those few that we will be forceful, force actually to select something more, uh, mostly relevant elements or something, and we'll come up at least with some solution. <clears throat> if if working memory could be potentially unlimited, able to handle any numbers of elements, in this case, we can, we can find themselves in a situation when, when we would be practically in, 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 in impossible to come up with any solution. And, and, and in critical situations, that would be, of course, catastrophic uh, consequences. So in a, in a way, so number of elements in this uh, 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 should, that could be considered at any time should be limited. Therefore, we evolve with that limited working memory capacity. Uh, on the other side, that have some important and useful side effect that actually trigger it generation of that powerful uh, knowledge based system that we have because that our knowledge base allows us to get around those, those limitations. So uh, there is some very good and useful and effective side effect of that limited working memory capacity because we evolve to compensate for that to develop a huge knowledge base. And we're going to talk about that next week, about that role of that knowledge base. But but this is just this combinatorial consideration argument. is just, of course, one of suggested of, 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 of uh, suggested explanations why we work with that limited working memory capacity and what advantages of that. Of course, it's, it's not the, the only or any universal explanation, just, just one possible explanation or consideration that we need to take. So again speaking about those a uh, role of working memory in more global kind of evolutionary perspective. So why are we or and if we are why we are more intelligent or what we treat it as cells more intelligent than other, other species that are around. Uh, so, most of our behavior, in fact, like most other species, are based on this, uh, what we call in the previous lecture, primary kind of knowledge. So, this evolved mechanisms that operate implicitly without really conscious processing. It doesn't require it. Enable fast decision making, that kind of biologically primary abilities. So, a lot of things that we do in life based on those type of abilities. Um, instinct called in other species, but but that pretty much pretty much the same. So and we use all of that in everyday life for uh, unlike other species, actually what we have um, we have this ability to to inhibit that execution that automated that of, of that type of of actions based on those primary ability and engage control cognitive processes in working memory. So this is a what why working memory possibly evolved in this case and, and what the sense of this just to enable us to, to 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 do this control processes, do some kind of mental manipulations, mental simulations, and so on to think about some projection and that for survival, that essential and that give us significant advantage to humans 
in 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 that evolutionary sort of terms. Uh, so the whole point of uh, uh, evolving as of that sort of working memory capacity, or working memory generally as, as, as a part of our cognitive system, is just to to increase our ability to cope with novel situations. So that novel situations that we can do successfully handle based on primary abilities, we can handle by actually um, inhibiting those primary ability, primary uh, uh, responses, and engaging this working memory processing in control way, and 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 move and find out in this way a new solution to novel situation and and, and increase this survival in evolutionary terms. So. Um, <clears throat> So we are uh, limited working memory capacity. Uh, this, 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 this mechanism of, of dealing with novel, uh, novel, novel situation is, as we know, in limited in processing capacity. But on the other side, by its limited, we look at some possible explanations. But on the other side, is again, it gave us some. Um, the trigger is this um, uh, development of huge knowledge base, uh, which is which is critical for again for our uh, cognitive architecture. And with next week we're going to talk about this role of knowledge base. So knowledge base and expertise in human cognition that will be topic about of, of the next lecture. So uh, <clears throat> that we're going to talk about generally uh, expertise, what it is, and 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 how that sort of and what the role of knowledge base and what kind of knowledge base. So we talk about the role of long-term memory and cognition and expert performance, the human cognitive architecture as a, as a kind of knowledge base system. And again, we look at some evolutionary perspective and uh, organized knowledge structures and long-term memory that would be more like instructional implications or instructional side of that. So the next lecture would be completely about sort of that sort of knowledge base that information store according to those uh, general principles that we uh, talk about it from one perspective is long-term memory from another perspective is a uh, information store from evolutionary perspective so we're going to talk about knowledge based on those perspectives again all right thank you very much if any questions please uh, So, any questions from uh, in the room also from yeah. the Sorry, I, I might go. I said last time was to, 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 to be no more than 90, 90 minutes. I mean, a, a little bit exceeded, but, but less than last time. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to ask about this like uh, evolutionary <clears throat> argument about the limitations. So, we can think of it that, okay, this was adaptive, but at the same time, we can also think of it that this is just like a sort of biological slash physical limit to the system that works which is like determined by completely extrinsic like factors in a sense that for instance we have like physical limitations of how big mammals can be because otherwise they would just like fall apart uh, uh, or uh, like some other like whatever the, the cranium size uh, which is determined by like, the, the anatomy during the, the, the time, time of birth so whether uh, whether it's necessary to think of the limitations of working memory as somehow like being adaptive to a degree or just it couldn't go any further because like some external limitations that, that might have if that makes sense uh, you actually even some uh, argument probably within your uh, line of reasoning is that uh, some uh, energy resources possible with the limitation and that actually stands behind to some degree of limitation of open memory. We don't have unlimited energy sources to, to run this kind of system. Maybe maybe this energy resource also plays this uh, role here, right? The supply of energy that we have. So I, I think that some limited, have some possible line of reasoning here too. Some of those kind of uh, limitations. Okay, yeah. I'm just I'm trying to understand from the teacher's perspective. So, say in an optimal world, we designed everything on the basis of CLT um, instructional design advice. 
and all the children got the instructions with the basis of no waste or you know cognitive load and we just focus on the kind of the good cognitive load. I'm thinking though if that were the case then the fact that working memory is adaptive we wouldn't have learned to adapt to the wasteful cognitive load which is part of everyday life right so I'm just thinking if these children learn just on the basis of zero wasteful would that maybe have negative effects then coming out in real life when actually there is a lot of wasteful, wasteful cognitive load especially in our lives but phones and um, lots of information coming in and out would that make it then less prone to be a bad very good question actually and we're going to talk more in, in the one in the fourth or fifth lecture this because the, the point is when the boundaries of um, the blue theory that the question which occupied me for some time recently uh, is it applicable in all situations or not really and we need to know for where it's most efficient where, where it should be applied and maybe where not and I can say that how did the world, all these approaches, techniques uh, are most effective when instructional goal is to uh, learn organized knowledge structure. If you need to learn some specific organized knowledge structure, for the schema or whatever, that let's say organized knowledge structure, that students need to learn some specific type of task, how to deal with it. The most Cognitive load in this case theory provides the most efficient way of learning the schematic knowledge structure, the main specific schemas, we can say, right? The most cognitively, I would say, efficient, meaning that that result would be achieved with a minimal resources. Resources in this case would be either time or could be some figuratively speaking headache. So you can learn some how to deal with specific type of task with a reasonable amount of time with minimal type of unnecessary effort, headaches figuratively, and you learn probably most rapidly, okay? Rather than with other approaches. However, learning task instructional role could be different. It could be something that you mentioned to enable students to cope with variety of different situations. Uh, could be something that uh, um, uh, motivational nature to motivate learners. And, and in this case, approaches could be different. And, and all this, in this case, maybe different techniques and approaches could be used. Therefore, let's, uh, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that type of instructional goals is essential. So, uh, acquisition of the main specific schemas, um, I would argue, cognitive load theory is the best. Uh, for other instructional goals, I wouldn't say that we do any type of kind of thing. Another one, Hugo. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I think for the presentation. Uh, I don't know if this is a uh, good intuition, but I feel like there are situations where having redundant information is beneficial. Like, for example, when I watch TV, I like to have the subtitles. So there's like, I have the sound and the subtitles, and I feel like I, I'm learning more in that way. Is this going counter to what the, the cognitive load theory would suggest? Okay, yeah, yes. Actually, that's uh, in some situation. That subtitle is not redundant. They, they definitely not redundant for, 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 for second language learners, right? For example, or for someone who some kind of deficiency in, 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 in listening uh, to, to understand the text. Or maybe text is too fluent to understand. So redundancy in this case meaning actually a real redundant. And then in some in many cases they will not be redundant. When we're dealing with the second language learners, uh, for them. That subtitle will be definitely not redundant. If, if, they, if, they, if the task is to, 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 to understand this, uh, or in this case, we're talking to, to enable understanding of spoken language. Okay? Depending on the type of task and the type of learners and the situation. So, redundancy, again, we always need to take into account that instructional goal here, what it is. Something that redundant in one case 
could not be redundant in another case. So it's always relative. So uh, when we're talking about redundancy, that's not universal. Always kind of get rid of that. Get rid of that if it's if it's if it should be getting if it would 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 inhibit learning for some specific learners. So uh, the same applies to probably any other type of redundancy. What is what is really called the redundant is uh, when, uh, when, when I would just come up with an example when 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 people design some um, PowerPoint presentation for instructional goals and use a lot of those unnecessary whistle and bells, some of those decorations, some of them, some flashing, and some, some many, many, many like to do that in their presentation, which is not really, could, could be not relevant to the specific instructional message, okay? It could be, on the other side, people sometimes say, I, I included that for motivational purposes, just to, uh, to, to, to increase motivation to learn. Okay, so my answer would be here, if it is relevant for motivation, just include it before your instructional message, if you believe that this is relevant for motivation. When you deliver some complex, difficult kind of task, instructional task, uh, it's better to get rid of any irrelevant things and, and, and stick to the point. Um, so in this case, that type of material, I would say would be would be redundant clearly for, for, for anybody. Uh, I, again, with some uh, with some notes that maybe for some motivational purposes that could be used, but but not mixed with actually instructional message itself. So uh, again, so what, with what what is redundant always kind of this uh, relative as well. So it needs to be. It's uh, it's a lot of uh, a lot of different fine print things now being attached to different cognitive load effect. And the more we go ahead, the number of those fine prints that, that actually describe where it is actually applicable, what the condition of applicability, is the number of those actually increasing. That example is the modality effect. Initially, like 30 years ago, or whatever the effect was firstly, it, it demonstrated. Everything was kind of clear. Always use dual modality, no matter what uh, auditory text and uh, visual picture or animation, and, and that's it. But 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 then some kind of condition started appear, like that one. Don't use it now. They say when the auditory text is is too long, because that will it reduces uh, transiency kind of situation effect. And that's not good. So in this case, we argue actually counter uh, the argument now. So use printed text on screen text if it's too long. So uh, again, and so on. So more, most of cognitive load effect now is coming with a <coughs> quite a set of conditions of applicability that you need to, it's actually even difficult to remember now. <laughs> conditions <laughs> of applicability that you can see that you know, and read, uh, uh, read the kind of uh, sources. Any other question from the room? Okay, so there are two questions online. So, so, so the first question is about if we if we apply this knowledge, if we apply this knowledge to foreign language instruction, say I want learners to acquire some new ex expressions, can I present them in a form of two to three words or chunks? For example, not dependent. It, it depends on is the is the load or cognitive effort different when learning one one word or two to three words? The, that possibly was uh, related to that example that I uh, provided with uh, in a language when we're talking about learning uh, vocabulary items versus some uh, learning grammar. All right, look. Um, I will learners to acquire expressions. Yes, uh, presenting. Of oh, course, oh, I, I, I say it, it, it makes sense in this case. Yes, uh, uh, that, that would be uh, treating these three words, which actually 
related here and 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 compose some kind of a a, a relevant inter in, interconnected uh, group and 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 these three words could be treated as a chunks if that grammar in these cases learn and that that we're going to talk about the role of chunking and the role of uh, uh, prior knowledge and uh, in, in the ne next next week lecture so but from my perspective yes um, uh, cognitive load effects are strongly depends on level of learner prior knowledge the learner prior knowledge is uh, considered as a single most important factor that influence instruction a single most important about all others prior knowledge therefore when we're talking about some uh, chunks essentially meaning that you already chunked based on some knowledge that part of your knowledge and that definitely would play a clear uh, a role how you need to do your instructions uh, if your learners already have this knowledge or if they don't have that knowledge and and they still to be acquired so in this case a uh, combination of words some grammatical structures they definitely could for more knowledgeable learners treat it as a single chunk single unit which is doesn't require a lot of work in memory capacity on the other hand with novice learners they still need to learn these combinations this grammatical structure that would be something that need to be learned with a significant effort and until that sub knowledge is required so the situation would be different and cognitive load approaches would be very difficult the very different and therefore we need to differentiate of course what type of technique could be used for learners with different level of prior knowledge and hopefully that won't answer it okay. to some degree so um, so so uh, the uh, last let, let, let me read that uh, okay <clears throat> So articulation, the articulation of the learning goal and what counts as learning is key uh, in, uh, in that it is used to judge whether cognitive load is productive or wasteful. If I want a student to understand the concept of accelerations as a rate of change of velocity, the treatment of the example given would be different and might not involve using kinematic equation at all. What advice do we have for certain learning goals? Uh, certain learning goals uh, in a sense that I talked before, <clears throat> relates firstly to uh, to the type of uh, outcome that you want to achieve, the, the, the level of achievement, uh, whether, for example, would be some uh, ability to just remember some fact learn or some concept learn or ability to apply this concept in some uh, realistic situations or even apply this concept in a still higher level in some uh, uh, new situation so those different types of learning goals would possibly require uh, different uh, types of approaches and uh, what type of, of of cognitive load in this case should uh, what type what what type of cognitive load we we we, we, we actually uh, uh, adopt uh, and we assume that is uh, that is intrinsic or extraneous to that specific goal. Uh, also, uh, in a, in a different more a broader perspective, uh, different types of, of of learning goals could be related. For example, some sometimes I call them pre-instructional goals, like goals to motivate learners or goal to activate some prior knowledge that could be also considered as a types of uh, learning goals uh, sometimes i call it pre-instructional meaning they something that should be achieved or done before actual instruction so again and those would require 
very at a different approaches as well. So, for example, in some cases, given learners some uh, problem to solve on their own, would 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 solve some of those goals uh, without any knowledge that problem solving could probably be unsuccessful, but still will solve that specific goal. So, uh, uh, again, um, uh, type of, uh, and for that reason, what was considered as a extraneous in purely instructional goals would be not extraneous, but, but actually productive in that achieving that pre-instructional goal, pre-instructional goal, like motivating or, 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 or activating prior knowledge. Therefore, I agree with that sort of point that type of cognitive load, again, would be depend on specific learning goal, whether it's extraneous or, 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 or intrinsic, that relevant, that, 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 that relative. Uh, as for the specific situation here with acceleration, uh, uh, to give specific advice in this case, look at two specific cases to, to, to handle that, that sort of uh, on, on the go now. We need that, that could be discussed possibly separately, considering specific specific material. Okay, thank, thank you, Slava. And also, um, it, the time is it, it's just the time. Uh, and thanks for everyone, and thanks for your attention today. Uh, if you are interested, if you continue, if you continue interested in this talk, we will meet again on 25th and 2 p.m. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, you can always uh, talk to Slava or email to Slava. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.